Foxes, Chapter 2. Slanting sunlight lit the jumble of rock posters, magazine photographs, album covers, feathers, Art Nouveau, brass jewelry, macrame hangings, ticket stubs, and bumper stickers plastered over all the available wall space in the small square bedroom. Looking down on Jeannie and Madge sleeping in tinker toy postures on the bed was a small black and white theater poster of Trilby playing the piano, wearing his most severe and satanic face. Deidre lay curled up on the floor beneath a six-foot-long full-color poster of the Grateful Dead. Nearby, beneath a hot waxen dye, purple and bile-colored wall hanging, sprawled a newcomer. Also on a nest of pillows, Annie, with her fluffy strawberry blonde hair, her full lips, round hips, and round breasts, was a lovely child woman. A basket of fruit, breathing heavily through her half-open mouth, she lay zonked out, oblivious to the bright swatch of sun streaming across her face and warming her naked body. The clock radio clicked and the disco version of Beethoven's Fifth came blasting into the stuffy room. Jeannie stirred, stretched out to her full length, and hit the floor. She gave Deidre a gentle nudge in the behind with her bare foot and headed for the door in a series of long slide steps in tune to the pounding Beethoven. Shake your booty, she said to Deidre, and the room in general. She cocked one leg out the door, threw up her trailing arm, and executed a dipping turn across the hall into the bathroom. Jeannie, don't stay in there, called Madge, lifting up on the bed and violently rumpling her thick, unruly hair to wake herself. I'm not even in there yet. God, said Jeannie from the bathroom. Madge made a sour face and reached over to turn the radio off. Deidre snaked up off the floor and picked her way over to the window, where she gave herself an all-over shiver like a colt. She crossed her arms over her breasts and turned back towards the room. We gotta wake up Annie, she said, looking down at the figure, stretched out peacefully in the jumble of pillows and sheets near the closet door. Annie, wake up. Annie, called Madge softly. Jeannie leaned out of the bathroom, toothbrush stuck in her mouth. Isn't she awake? She mumbled through the obstruction. Not yet, said Madge, sitting on the edge of the bed, her white terry cloth robe draped loosely around her. Well, do something, you guys, said Jeannie, making an ogre face. I didn't hear her come in, Deidre said. I was totally vetched. She leaned down, snapped on the radio again, pulled it off the little blue night table, the full length of its cord, and placed it on the floor next to Annie's head. The Bee Gees, more than a woman, wailed out at volume. Deidre turned it up louder. That won't work, Jeannie called over the high-intensity noise. She came in goosed. She was sick all over this guy's car. From what? asked Deidre, peering down at her friend's placid, sleeping face. Quaaludes, beer, wine, some other thing, too, said Jeannie. Some kind of really heavy pills. She couldn't remember. Jeannie disappeared back into the bathroom. Madge stopped brushing her hair and leaned off the edge of the bed to gaze down on Annie. Poor thing, she said. Teenage dopers, what a waste, Deidre deadpanned. Jeannie came back into the room, armed with a glass of water and a bath towel. She stooped down and clicked off the radio, then poured a driblet of water on Annie's forehead. Oh, don't do that, said Madge with a worried look. Shh, Jeannie said, don't worry. The Three Stooges, they always just throw it, said Deidre, struggling into a pair of tight Chiori jeans. She can't do that. She'll drown, said Madge. I'm only saying that's what the Three Stooges always do. I didn't say she should do it, okay? Deidre tugged her sipper upwards slowly. Jeannie flicked more water at the faintly snoring totally flaked out Annie. Nothing happened. She stood up and made a face. She's going to flunk out, you know. She ditches one more day. They're going to put her on the street. Forget it, said Deidre, turning away and bending down to scrounge among the deep litter for her makeup bag. What's that mean, said Jeannie, looking over at Deidre's, Deidre's ass sticking up amid the flurry of pillows and sheets and clothes. I mean, what the shit, said Deidre, without turning around. Anyone see my bag, the beaded one? Please, said Madge, still leaning off the edge of the bed, wanting everybody to get along. 
She doesn't care if she never wakes up, Deidre said. You believe that? Jeannie asked. Deidre just shrugged and rooted around in the rovent bean bag she had just located in the rubble. You believe that? Jeannie asked again, slightly incredulous. Deidre was bored with the issue. She found her spun silver mauve eyeshadow and turned away toward the vanity mirror with the rock concert ticket stub stuck all around the edges of its tarnished wood frame. Jeannie was pissed. She looked away from Deidre to Madge, then down at Annie. After a brief struggle with herself, she stepped around to Annie's side and tossed the whole glass of water smack in her face. Hey, said Deidre, jumping back from the splattered water. Annie's eyes opened and shut a couple of times, and then stayed open but unfocused. She swallowed the water that had splashed in her mouth. Finally, her eyes began to track. She took a deep breath and immediately started coughing from the water in her nose. Between hacks, she noticed the three figures hovering above her. All innocence, she looked from one to the other. What are you guys looking at? The three girls groaned in disbelief and turned back to their own doings. Chapter 3 A pleasant, green-tinted light filtered through the dozens of vines and succulents and leafy plants arrayed on the shelves and in macrame hangers around the breakfast nook. It was a corner Jeannie had decorated herself, trying to make it especially nice for her mother. However, the two Maxfield Parish prints were now rather the worse for wear, curling at the edges, water spotted. Most of the plants wore a defeated air. Lots of yellow and brown leaves among the green. The shells themselves carried as much junk as plants. Old letters and bills, hairpins, rubber bands, recipes torn from newspapers, beat up paperbacks, dead leaves. Amid the clutter of the tiny breakfast nook, all four girls hunched around the table, each eating her kind of breakfast. Between dainty nibbles of a pear and sips of her hibiscus tea, Deidre bent her head between her legs and alternately teased and brushed furiously at her reddish-brown mane of hair. Jeannie stood with one foot on the chair and leaned down to munch on a large bowl of crunchy granola. Madge, with a bowl of granola and strawberries and a carton of yogurt in front of her, reached across and poured Annie a cup of coffee. You guys are so dragged with me, said Annie, looking halfway together in tight new straight leg jeans rolled at the ankles and black spiked heels. How's your head? Jeannie, looking very down on it in her man-styled Oxford cloth shirt and bib overalls, spoke through a glob of granola. Annie shook her tussled, strawberry blonde head back and forth as though to clear the fog. Like there was a whole bunch of people living in there, but they all moved out. She emitted a short groan. Ugh, am I sick. Yeah, I want to ditch six period and drive to the beach, Jeannie asked leaning her head back and jamming a big bronze bobby pin over one ear to keep the tawny blonde hair out of her cereal bowl. I got a hair appointment at Sack, said Deidre, in her weary, sophisticated voice. Thought you said I couldn't ditch, said Annie. Phys ed? You can ditch that, Jeannie answered. Perfecto beach day. The smog is supposed to be depraved this afternoon. Save our lungs, send a child to the beach. She gave a raised fist salute. What are you going to do to your hair? Madge asked. Her own hair was pinned back carelessly on both sides with barrettes. God, I hope nothing fierce, Deidre said. Mom's after me to get it chopped so I can look like Dorothy Hamill. What? said Madge sympathetically. Good luck, grumbled Deidre. She doesn't dig me wearing all her clothes and having guys think I'm mature. Okay, like like they would be going for me and not looking at her. Get them to chop your head instead, hey? Said Annie between careful sips of her yellow plastic coffee mug. That's pretty bad considering who it was got sick all over this guy's car last night, Deidre retorted, using her limpest, oh, you tedious infant tone of voice. Who cares, said Annie without looking up. He cares. Don't you care? Deidre came back. I didn't even know him. He picked me up hitching. 
Besides, it was this really gross Trans Am with some jerk-off dragon blowing smoke all over the hood. He was a jerk-off, too, actually. What do you expect, pitching? said Jeannie, frowning. Was he cute? Madge asked. Annie sipped her coffee and stared blankly through the window, as though she didn't hear. Finally, she said, Who? Oh, the geek in the car. geek Lloyd said Deidre. The only geek I know is Randy Taratunian, said Annie. So, Deidre gave her a how stupid can you get face. So, you're the one who thinks he's hot. I do not. Yeah, Jeannie stuck her nose in. You said you wanted to go with him. She lifted the pear off Deidre's plate, gnawed off a giant bite, and plunked it back down. Eyeing her decimated fruit, Deidre answered with great patience. I never said I wanted to go with him. I said I wanted to ball with him. There's a difference. The others had tired of the conversation. Match had been watching Annie with concern. Your dad know you were here last night? I gotta call him. Annie answered nonchalantly. Jeannie and Madge exchanged worried looks. Annie saw the looks out of the corner of her eye, but ignored them. She slid off her chair and sauntered into the living room. Guess what? Deidre suddenly stood up. For a big, elaborate change, we're late again. I don't believe it. Relax. Hey, we just left, said Jeannie grabbing her leather pouch off the counter and digging around in the bottom. I'm always getting tardies, Deidre whined. My keys. Damn it, Jeannie spouted. She stalked into the living room, chucked her bag angrily onto the couch, and started rooting furiously among the papers, magazines, pens, wrapping paper, and general crap on the end table next to the telephone. Oh, no. Again? called Madge, unhelpfully. Keys! shouted Jeannie, throwing Madge a look as she came in the room. Madge covered her mouth guiltily, then started searching around under the school books and notebooks on the couch. In the bedroom, jeans, t-shirts, silver jackets, sneakers, knee socks, the colors of rainbows, flew in the air like a juggler show. Keys, shouted Jeannie, flinging a chair cushion aside with such a zip it tore the Save the Whale, Save the Earth poster off the closet door. Fuck a room, she grumbled, and kept on digging. Madge was on her knees on the far side of the bed. Annie sauntered in, carrying a can of cores in one hand. She perched her bottom on the little blue-painted chest of drawers and watched the flurry. Jeannie turned at the sharp pop fizz and watched Annie take a swig. She gave her a sour look and turned back to the search. Annie pushed around the album covers on the top of the bureau and pulled one of them out. Can I listen to Abbey Road? Everybody ignored her. One by one, Deidre picked up the dozen pairs of tennis and jogging shoes and shook them upside down very gingerly, as though some unspeakable thing beside keys might come plopping out. Whenever I need to mellow out, I always listen to my mom's Abbey Road, Annie rattled on. We're going to school, okay? said Jeannie, straightening up, throwing a balled up t-shirt into the leather chair. When I'm 18, I'm going to shine that place, said Annie. Yeah, well, you're 15 now, said Jeannie, heading for the door. Annie slipped off the chest and followed Jeannie out the door. Ain't that a bitch, she said. Motioning Annie not to follow her, Jeannie soft-footed down the hallway, past the living room to the end door. She put her hand on the doorknob and waved Annie and Madge and Deidre on into the living room. She steeled herself for a moment, then noiselessly turned the handle and slipped into her mother's bedroom. Mary, big, blonde, and still well put together at 40, slept with abandon. She sprawled on her stomach over half the queen-size bed, long arms clutching the pillow fervently, one long naked leg drawn up and sticking out from under the sheet. Next to her lay Sam, also sound asleep, breathing with a slight raspy snore. With his round, bald head, his mouth half open, his fuzzy beard and hairy shoulders, chest and arms, Sam had the air of a teddy bear at middle age. Tiptoeing to the bedside, Jeannie stooped down and fished in her mom's woven Mexican tote bag. She carefully drew out the large bunch of keys on the leather thong. The thong caught on the wallet clasp and the keys jingled. 
Mary's large, pale blue eyes blinked open. Where are you going? She whispered, not moving a muscle. School, said Jeannie in a normal voice. Mary flapped her hand in a shushing motion and made a pained face. Leave the keys, she whispered. Why? asked Jeannie in a lower voice. You can't take the truck. We'll talk later. How come? Jeannie stood up and looked at her mother blank face. We'll talk when you get home. That's unfair, Jeannie answered again in a normal voice. Mary grimaced and put her finger to her lips. Come right home, she said in a hoarse whisper. Sam stirred. Mary eased up on an elbow and glanced at Sam. Can't we talk now? asked Jeannie, making no attempt to whisper. No, dear, please. I don't want to start anything now. Mary reached out a hand for Jeannie's, hanging at her side. Jeannie pulled away. I don't want to have to worry all day. You're going to pull some big number later. Jeannie's face was impassive but her voice carried an edge of disgust at the hassle. She stared at the padded plastic decorator headboard. The school called. Mary continued her strained whisper. Oh, God, I'm not going to talk about this now. She looked victimized, glancing wordly at Sam. I know. Jeez, Janie muttered. Child development. You've been cutting. Just child development, Jeannie said, making a short throwing gesture with the hand that still grasped the keys. It's so stupid, Mom. You wouldn't believe it. Can't I have the keys, please? Jeannie allowed a slight wheedling tone into her voice, despite herself. Putting her hand over her eyes, Mary said, I don't want to have a bad day, Jeannie. It's my truck. Dad gave it to me. Mary let her hand fall and clamped her teeth together in distress, hoping that silence would end the issue. Jeannie threw some daggers and slammed the keys back into the tote bag. Sam turned and lifted up on one elbow. This is Sam, said Mary, with a look of resignation. Hello, said Sam, curling his face into a friendly, sleepy smile. My daughter, Jeannie. Hi, said Jeannie, straight-faced. I'm pleased to meet you, said Sam. Jeannie managed an awkward, fleeting smile but snapped it off like a light when she looked at her mother. She turned and was out of the room in four fast strides, closing the door with a firmness just short of a slam.